little bit of a funny Sunday. It's holiday weekend, so we're all relaxed, but it's a high feast day in the church. So we're chill and we're celebrating at the same time. We can do it. Uh, the Feast of Pentecost celebrated the first coming of the Holy Spirit to all who believed in Christ, Jew and Gentile alike, to the Jews and then to the non-Jews, and equipped them to boldly spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's a mission we continue to this very day. Uh, if you've been an Anglican for any amount of time, you'll know we also call this Whit Sunday. And to be honest, we don't know why we call it Whit Sunday. There's a lot of theories out there about why it's called Whit Sunday, but here's the one I like the most. Jesus said, the fields are white as harvest, right? When it's time to, to bring the harvest in, the fields look white. So, Whit Sunday, White Sunday. I think that's as good as interpretation <laughs> as any. So with that, will you say the acclamation with me on your leaflet? The Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. You shall know that the Lord is in the midst of his people. And that he is the Lord, and there is none else. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you pray with me the collect for purity in your booklet? Together, Almighty God, and to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Just a housekeeping note before we go on to the Gloria and Excelsis. Um, there's a familiar face who's not here today. Fuji is not doing well today again. It's, it's a cold. Um, so we pray for him. And we also have uh, Jim with us today. Um, a not familiar face to me, but I know some of you know him and we're, we're really happy to have him serving us on the, on the ivories today. So, let's say together the Gloria and Excelsis. Glory be to God on high, and in earth peace with will will towards men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, Thou takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God our Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy. Thou only art the Lord, Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art our most high in the glory of God the Father. Father. Amen. Amen. I say to you, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And let us pray. Almighty God, on this day, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you revealed the way of each 
eternal life to every race and nation. Pour out this gift in you, that by the preaching of the gospel, your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we hear our first reading. A reading from the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning at the first verse. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed, and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, and Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Praise thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Man goeth forth to his work and to his labor until. Thank you. 
chapter beginning at the 29th verse. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to them, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And the leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and he spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Strange for a professional librarian, I know. And some of you rightly gasped in mock horror, and that's when I knew we were going to get along just fine. <laughs> well, I'm going to make another literary confession today. I have never finished reading The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. 
I know, shocking. I picked it up recently again, and one of the first things that happens in the book is that Huckleberry Finn escapes from the top story bedroom where a kind widow and her rather stern sister have given Huck sleeping quarters with the hopes that they can reform him. But Huck Finn just can't stand to sleep in a normal bed in a nice house. Why? Because he's a wild child. That's why. How do we know he's wild? Just because he escapes from his bedroom? Then no. It's because we have read the first book, the prequel, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Well done. Five points for all of you. We know from the earlier part of the story that Tom's main characteristic is a streak of criminality. He's a bad boy. And we don't get far into the adventures of Huckleberry Finn before Tom proves that to be absolutely true. He assembles a gang with Finn and others. He plans murders and robberies all in his imagination. But still, a little bit of a criminal. Now, if you hadn't read Tom Sawyer, but started with Huck Finn and read as far as Tom's plotting, you might conclude that Tom is the wild one. But no, Finn is the wild child. So let's apply this same thought experiment to John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth, as they're portrayed in the opening of Mark's Gospel. Who would you say is the wilder one? John or Jesus? At first blush, John seems to be the stranger one, doesn't he? Possibly because his strangeness is condensed into a few short verses in which he yells a lot, wears odd clothing, eats strange food, and lives in the wilderness. Or perhaps we feel John is the more unfamiliar one of the two because we've heard more stories told about Jesus and heard lots of teaching by Jesus. So we might feel that our picture of Jesus is more rounded than that of John's. And it's true that the verisimilitude, I love that word, the realness of a rounded character like John against a more stereotypical uh, bit piece character like John, though I meant a rounded character like Jesus, against a more stereotypical bit character like John, makes us feel like Jesus is more familiar, less strange. But I want to propose a thesis today, and that is this. Between John and Jesus, Jesus is the stranger one. Jesus was the stranger one because he was God. And God is more other to us than John, who was, after all, a mere human. Only Jesus of all the billions who have lived in the history of the world was both God and human. And how, or, or from what source, other than the Gospels, do we know the truth of what God is like? The Old Testament. The Old Testament reveals not only what God is like, but what Jesus will be like in the Gospels. It's, it's like reading Tom Sawyer before Huck Finn, so that you know who the wilder stranger one actually is. But in case you're not convinced, let me attempt to prove this using today's Gospel text. Now I'm riffing off a sermon title today uh, from a book title named uh, Jesus Mean and Wild? The Unexpected Love of an Untamable God by former Christianity Today author Mark Galley. And I promise this is the last book that I'll flash today. 
His book is entitled Jesus Mean and Wild. My sermon title, and the, the picture that I'm going to spend some time painting this afternoon is Jesus Meek and Wild. Jesus Meek and Wild. Jesus praying in a desolate place shows us his meekness, while his healing of the leper shows us some of his wildness. Jesus in the desolate place is meekness. The healing of the leper shows us some of Jesus' wildness. Well, if you were listening really closely last week and this week to the Gospel reading, you'll notice there was a little bit of overlap. Today we began our Gospel text in the place we left off last week. Last week, our Gospel reading ended in the place we began today with the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. How appropriate for last Sunday, it being Mother's Day. Remember how she was healed immediately of her fever, which means the healing of Jesus' hands was so complete that not only her symptoms disappeared, but her strength immediately returned. How many of you have had a fever of some sort, high, low, or in between? Yeah. Recall how weak you felt for days afterwards? Not Peter's mother-in-law. Immediately, Mark's favorite word, hutus, immediately, she returns to her role as household hostess, which, as we saw last week, was a place of honor for her, not work. And she would need that strength for the hustle and bustle of Peter's house once word started getting out that Jesus was curing people on the spot. Okay, second question for you today. Has anyone here visited Capernaum in the Holy Land in Israel? Marilyn, I see that hand. Now, Peter's house in Capernaum wasn't a West Coast box like we see all around the Lower Mainland. It was rather a mini compound focused in on the middle. Like many houses of the period, it, it had a courtyard with multiple hearths for cooking and stairs up to the rooftops where on a hot sunny night, which is many nights in the Middle East, they would go up to the roof to sleep. Multiple generations would have lived here. So it was no little hovel, but still it couldn't accommodate all the townspeople and everyone within shouting distance who brought their sick to be healed by Jesus. And he did heal many sick and demon-possessed people that night. Uh, many, in case you're wondering, is a Hebrew way of saying all. It doesn't mean that of all those who came to see him, he just picked a few to heal. No. Those who were healed were many. Everyone who was sick was healed. That's a good day's work, even if you're the Son of God. With all that power going out from him, he must have been tired and deserved a good night's sleep. But in our Gospel text, Mark reports, that Jesus did not sleep the whole night. Without the assistance of an alarm or an iPhone, what Jesus does is odd indeed, writes Mark Galley. It should not surprise us that Jesus, a man of prayer even more so than the saints, who, like John the Baptist, are merely humans, after all, it should not surprise us that Jesus will act oddly sometimes. Before the sun rises, he disappears from Peter's house. Why? Why would he do this? Is he a morning person? Now, I wouldn't call myself a morning person, uh, but compared to my lovely wife Sherry, well, I, I well remember the morning where I must have been a bit too chatty because she looked up from her Bible and asked me, why are you talking? 
I stopped talking at that point. Why does Jesus disappear here? Is he an introvert like me? Or, or possibly like some of you? Does he need time to recharge? No, it's a lot simpler than that. He needed to pray. I can imagine Jesus agreeing wholeheartedly with Julian of Norwich's exclamation, whose feast day we observed last week, if you follow the church calendar. She writes, I saw him and I sought him. I had him, yet I wanted him. I had him, yet I wanted him. This humble dependence of Jesus, the Son of God, on the Father, demonstrates his meekness. We have a God who is not ashamed to need the other members of the Trinity. What's that mean for us? So St. Timothy's, I'm, I'm just getting to know you, but I want to ask you, I want to challenge us. Are we people of prayer? Do we feel a need to pray? If not, why not? Jesus was the Son of God, God himself, and he was driven to pray. It would stand to reason then that we who are not God's, last time I checked, would have even more need to pray than Christ did. Now Jesus also prayed out of need, but his need was, was a need to maximize the unbroken communion that he had with the Father and the Spirit. More on that next week, uh, which is Trinity Sunday. And Jesus exercises further meekness, and it has to be said, patience, as he resists the disciples who have suddenly located him. Now the verb that the NIV translates as looking for is never used positively in Mark's Gospel. Whenever people look for Jesus in Mark, they are trying to exploit him, manipulate him, and use him. This posse of disciples hunting him down are no different. And the word, the word that Mark uses here is the same word that the Greek version of the Old Testament uses for Saul chasing after David. And what did Saul want to do to David? Kill him. What a success last night was, his disciples might have said. Come back to Capernaum, Lord, and we can capitalize on your success. More healings, more people, more fame. More, more, more. And Jesus does want more, but not more of that. Not more of being a wonder worker. His hours of early morning prayer have reset his compass, and he knows what he has to do go on to the next towns so that he can preach there, for that is why he came out. His words exactly. I came to preach. Let's move on. Second passage in our gospel text is the healing of the leper. Now, if you have a study Bible, you might notice a little note saying, this is not a leprosy that is still widespread in some parts of the world. Right? That's uh, technically known as Hansen's disease. It's, it's the wasting disease, which r looks roughly the same. But in ancient Near Eastern times, any kind of skin condition was considered leprosy. In fact, even the walls in your house, if there was some sort of mildew, that was considered leprosy. And whether it was on the skin or walls or the bowl or, or anywhere, it was unclean. Now remember we saw Jesus first healing the mother-in-law's fever. 
What I didn't mention last week is that when he raises her up, he literally rebukes the fever like a demon. And then we saw him praying and preaching. And now we see him with the leper healing again. And this format in Mark has a really technical name. It's called the sandwich format. Sorry if I made you hungry there. Uh, this sandwich format is very common in Mark. He uses it often. The most common sandwiches are the ones where he tells part of the story, that's top of the sandwich, then he turns his attention to something else entirely, different people, different setting, that's the, that's the meat of the sandwich, and then he returns to the original part of the story to finish it off, that's the bread on the bottom, bread, meat, bread, sandwich. Healing and or exercising, Peter's mother-in-law, praying and preaching, and then healing again. That's the structure we have here. And I spent just a moment on it because we'll see it throughout the Gospel of Mark. And in this particular instance, it serves to highlight the importance of the middle part, which is the praying and the preaching. But even though the praying and the preaching is the most important part, it's the healing of the leper that shows us the wild side of Jesus of Nazareth. First the meek, now the wild. Now, you heard me reading the Gospel text earlier. You might be asking, where's the wild here? Where's the wild? What I see in this passage, you may be saying, is Jesus allowing a man with an incurable skin condition to approach him? He listens to the man, he allows him to be touched, power goes out from him, healing the disease, and then he sends the man on his way. And you would be right, that's the base plot. Yeah, all that's wild about that is that the man was cured miraculously. And if you know the law of Moses, it's also pretty wild that Jesus allowed the unclean man to touch him in the first place. Those with these types of skin conditions are supposed to yell, unclean, unclean, to, to passers-by, and not approach them, let alone touch them. And it's also wild that Jesus pronounces him clean, because Jesus is not a priest. Pronouncing a person clean of leprosy is a priest's job, and that's all the way in the Jerusalem temple, which is far away from Galilee. So, hold on. This is sounding wilder and wilder, isn't it? And there's more that you can only see clearly in the original Greek. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Here I'll limit it to two, but I want to take them in reverse order. Where the English text reads, Jesus sternly charged him. The literal meaning is to denounce harshly, to scold, to drive away. Pretty strong, pretty wild. And before that, where our ESV translates Jesus' feelings as moved with pity, and other translations render it as compassion, there's ambiguity about what that phrase actually means. Now again, Mark uses ambiguous language often. Here it literally means moved in the internal organs. Take your pick of organ, I'm not going to uh, expand on that here. Point is, it's an indication of intense emotion. But it's intensified because Mark's meaning is, is ambiguous, or, or perhaps better said, he's using a double meaning. It's a little joke. It's not a funny joke. It's a joke. It's a play on words. No doubt Jesus felt pity or compassion for the man. But that's a translational interpretation, as all interpretations are. 
Another interpretation, another translation, the one that's used less often is this. When Jesus was filled with intense emotion, he was indignant. Indignant. What, what might that mean? Was it indignant? Or was it compassion? Why couldn't it be both? Compassion towards the man because indignant about the man's condition as a result of the curse of the fall. This reflects the triune Godhead's settled, continuous, and simultaneous dispositions of compassion towards fallen humanity, as well as indignation or anger or wrath against what's wrong with the world. Um, as you'll hear me say many times from this lectern and often in conversation, the world has fallen and it often falls on us. But Christ has come to reverse the effects of the fall and the healings in Mark's gospel are like lights in the distance drawing nearer, signs of a better future. We could call them portents of Pentecost, which, as, as I mentioned at the outset of the service, we celebrate today in the church calendar. The message that God was keeping, his promise, was to come and save the world through his Son. And Jesus said exactly that about his mission when his disciples found him in the desolate place. I came to preach. So the signs and wonders are all well and good, but they're beside the point. They point to the message, not the other way around. We are to focus on the message, not the signs. And so on Pentecost, we continue the mission of Christ and the power of the Spirit. How do we do that? Same as Christ. We preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. And will you please stand with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which we will say today together. standing if you are able for the prayers of the people.
Heavenly Father, I come before you in humility to intercede for the needs and the desires of the congregation of St. Timothy's. You know our needs before we even ask. But as St. Paul reminds us, we are not to be anxious about anything, and everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, we let our request be made known to God. At the prompt, Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. Please respond, hear our prayer. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. Hear our prayer. We pray for the Universal Church. <clears throat> We pray for the Anglican Church of North America and for God's clear leading for the Acton College of Bishops as they elect a successor for our climate. We pray for the Anglican Network in Canada, for Dan, for Stephen and Mike, our bishops, for all of the churches in the network. Today, especially praying for St. Peter and St. Paul's and the Church of the Messiah both in Ottawa. In our own community of the North Shore, we pray for Lynn Valley and Seymour United Churches. We pray for St. Timothy's. For the congregation, especially today for Joanna and Wanda, Ryan Mays Whiskey. We pray for all of our ministries, today especially for our video and website ministry. We pray for Father Mark and his family, as they prepare to join us in St. Timothy's. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. You are our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and direct the rulers of this world. We pray for all of our world leaders, especially Charles, our King, Justin, our Prime Minister, and David, our Premier, for all of those in public service who labor for the common good. We pray for peace in war-torn areas of the world. Israel, the Ukraine, and Sudan. We pray for safety and comfort for the millions of displaced people in our world. We pray for the war-torn areas in East Africa where people face a severe famine. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. Hear our, Hear our prayers. For all of those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, we pray especially today for the Anglican Relief and Development Fund of Canada. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, especially those in Nigeria. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. Hear our prayer. For all of those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray especially for those who have lost homes in the flooding in Afghanistan and Brazil. We pray for those evacuated from their homes and their communities and those fighting the fires in Northern BC, in Alberta, and Manitoba. We pray for healing for Bishop Charlie, for Chris, for Amy, for Maddie, for Jessica and Anne, for Kit Kinney, for Megan and Graham. And at this time, either aloud or in the silence of your heart, pray for those known to you, known to you who are in need of God's healing. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. We pray for all of those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection. And in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us. Hear our, Hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, may we look for and know your presence through the Holy Spirit in our daily lives and in our times of pain 
and in our worship. Create new life in your people and renew and refresh us as we turn in, in obedience and faith to you. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We have considered in prayer our world and others. Now in confession, we turn our eyes inward to ourselves and our relationship with the Lord. Would you adopt a posture of prayer as you are comfortable doing? As we maintain a few moments of silence and then humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Say together, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Maker and Judge of our soul, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and offenses, which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. The Lord be most just and feel the righteous standard against us. We pray that we be sorry for the things our trying to The burden of our hands is more. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever more serve and please you in this life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the absolution pronounced by the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And with that pardon, would you please stand? I say to you, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Now please show a sign of peace to one another. As you make your way back to your seats, I'm not rushing anybody, uh, but number 480 is our offertory hymn, Come Holy Ghost, Our Souls insp Inspire, and we'll sing all verses. 480.
bless you. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, 
Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. We humbly pray that all who partake in this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we do not want to take you, but deliver us from evil. For the God is the kingdom. Say to you, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks to God. God.
Announcements when Angie's not here, so oh, Patricia, please. Shoulders. 
for, for help with um, different things for the, um, for the party. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but it's going through my head now. Anyway, sign up sheet downstairs, so please sign up. Um, is there anything else, Marilyn? Patty? Do you want people to bring their own deck chairs to your house? Yeah, we will. I'm hoping Fuji was going to ask if they if we can use the tables. So hopefully we'll get the tables from downstairs. Chris has got a truck, so we can bring them over. If you've got some, bring your own chair would be would be great. Thanks, Patty. Yeah, we did talk about that. Um, um, or if you've got more than, you know, you know bring, bring one each for each of you, and if you've got a couple of extras, great. We, we, we've got a few, but I don't have 30 or 40 in my <laughs> basement or anything. But, uh, I think that's all. Marilyn? Nope. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Patricia. I'm sure we'll have that all in email form in due course, and I'm, at least I'm hoping for my sake. With all the details are written down. Okay. Uh, please keep everyone in, uh, in prayer that was uh, listed in the email that went out. Um, especially Fuji. Um, you know, I, I feel his presence or lack of presence keenly uh, when he's not here. So please pass on our best wishes back to, uh, to Fuji. Um, he's probably watching the hockey game. He's probably figured out there's a hockey game on, and he's in the right way. No? Maybe he knows by now. I'm sure none of the rest of you will turn on the hockey game after the service. No, nobody. I know some of us have other things to do, Nancy. Yes. Uh, break a leg tonight. And I, that, I, that's being nice, right? That's the actor in our midst, just performing in the Pirates of Penzance. So, uh, tickets still available, right? Um, the last thing I wanted to say, uh, I didn't mention the proverbial elephant in the room. Our liturgical color is red for Pentecost. And we are wearing red. Why might red, the color of blood, the color of martyrs, be the color of Pentecost? It's because... Hmm? Blade. Blade? Close. Yes. Well, it's a symbol that when we go out and preach the gospel, they might bleed. It might hurt. We might be martyred in extreme cases, but we still preach the gospel. Right? That's the message of Pentecost. So next week we head into ordinary time, uh, which is not so ordinary. It just means we're not celebrating any festivals for a little while. So for six months, we're green. I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. No, no, Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday, I've got ahead of myself. One more week of festival. Okay, so we'll celebrate for one more week. Uh, so with that, um, let us open to the recessional hymn, number 490, and I will pronounce the blessing on you, and then we will sing. Thank you again to Jim for accompanying us today. So I say to you, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Let's sing.
against the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.